Um, well, this is not a math talk. Maybe it's clear that this is a talk about communicating math. And I would like to make it as much as possible a conversation rather than a lecture. So you will do a great deal of good service if when I ask for your opinion, you, you speak up and volunteer. Uh, specifically, you know, what would be your choice? I'll, I'll try to give you a number of choices I had to confront when writing for the Times. Um, and then we could discuss what you think might be the right choice. There isn't any correct answer as far as I know. I can ultimately tell you what I tried. But um, I'd be interested in having some discussion. So maybe the first place to begin is, um, well, I should suppose I should thank the math department and Jim Simons for inviting me to give these lectures. And thank you all for, for coming. But as far as the New York Times, I uh, happened one day to get a phone call from David Shipley, the editor of the op-ed page of the, of the New York Times, who asked me to meet with him in New York City next time I was in, in the city. You know, I, he said, would you like to have lunch sometime? So I thought, yes, I'll take you up on that. He said, meet me at the um, Oyster Bar in Grand Central Station. Do you know the Oyster Bar? I see a big reaction. Yeah, I mean, this seems like a very, you know, this is where you would meet the editor. So anyway, I found the Oyster Bar. We're sitting in there. and. He said, would you ever have time to write a series for us? Now, you, maybe I should back up a little. Why is the editor of the New York Times calling me? I, I had written a few op-eds over the years, and I came to know this gentleman, David Shipley. And so, um, I don't know. He felt like he wanted a series for some reason. I'm not sure why. But anyway, he said, would you ever have time? And I said, it happens that I would have time in the spring of what was last year because I had done all my teaching in the fall, and so I didn't have any courses to teach. I could imagine doing it. So the next question was, what would the series be? How would you do a math series in the newspaper? Like, what would you cover? Now, here comes the first question. One of us at that lunch said that the series should walk straight through the curriculum. It should start in preschool and you know, then discuss things like numbers and addition and subtraction and go through elementary school into algebra and geometry and just keep going as far as it could go, systematically. Explaining all the things that the humanities types that read the New York Times never really understood in the first place. <laughs> um, now, the other of us said, well, actually, what the series could be is something topical. There's always math in the news. Um, you know, now we could be writing about the nuclear problems in Japan or global warming or the census. I mean, there's always something mathematical that could be discussed. And to make it relevant for the readers, it should be something like that. So the first question is, do you have a guess which one of us said which, <laughs> which thing? Um, I wonder. So I don't have clicker technology here. So why don't we do it the old fashioned way? If you think, um, which, which one of you, or which of you think I suggested doing the um, walk through the curriculum? Uh -huh. So I would say that's less than half the audience. And so <laughs> the others think that I'm the one who would say do math in the news. Is that right? Or do some of you have no opinion? Yeah, OK, good. So everybody has an opinion. That's excellent. And well, the right answer is, that um, David Shipley said, do not write about the news. <laughs> he doesn't want the news. He wants this grinding, pedantic march through the curriculum. <laughs> and I was so surprised by that, because that, that is just sweet music to my ears. You know, that's, that's the first thing any of us would think of. But it's a fantasy. Really, I can just explain at the beginning and just keep going. He said, yeah, I think our readers would like that, because they it's very easy structure to follow. They'll know if we're doing long division, then next we're going to do x and y, and you know, that everyone will know where we are. And he really thinks that people are baffled. And he himself was a, a, uh, an English major at Williams College. And he said he just never really understood the point of all this. And he feels sad that he was left out of math all those years. And he'd like another try. <laughs> so that was the goal of the series. And, um, so one of the questions then, uh, well, anyway, we agreed I'd start in January of, of 2010, I suppose it was. Is that right? Yeah, right. It was last spring. No. What is it now? 
Let's see what the date is here. Yeah, January of 2010. Okay, so um, 15 columns, we agreed. I write 15 pieces. And uh, now another question would be, who, okay, realistically, now that this is gonna happen, who is the target audience? Um, the, the tautological answer would be, the audience is the people who would read the New York Times. And that's probably the best answer. But, but, you know, who are those people? You always have to think about who the audience is in any communication endeavor. And so, you know, like one cynical view of it would be the people who are going to read this are fellow mathematicians and scientists. A lot of them read the newspaper too. And so I should really be writing to them. We don't do such a great job of communicating with each other. So why not just write for the people who might read it? Another view would be, oh, come on, there are a lot of people who like math. Think of all the people who used to read Martin Gardner in Scientific American in the mathematical uh, games section. It's true, that, that was very popular, so he doesn't write for them anymore. You could write for Martin Gardner's audience. That would include, for instance, the choice of putting puzzles in or, um, you know, interesting theorems, whatever. You could write at a fairly high level, but not professional mathematicians. You could also do what was asked, just write for smart people who know no math. Okay, that would be a much lower level than Martin Gardner's audience. Um, and another population that could be discussed or considered is there's a lot of parents out there who are baffled by what their kids are being subjected to in elementary school. I see this with my kids taking what's called everyday math. It's a certain curriculum out of University of Chicago. and. The, my wife would have no idea how to teach our eight or 10 year old what they ask you know, the students to learn. So, so how about writing for the parents and their kids? Um, what do you think would be, do anyone want to comment or maybe raise a fifth possibility? I mean, is, does this question grab you? Any reaction? You could be mute. Yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, I need to say one thing for the camera operator here. So we're, this is being recorded for um, a discussion about communication in general in math, is that it? Or for, anyway, there's some, for some reason these lectures are being recorded. So I need, I need to ask your permission, David, and any other speaker, that you, if you speak up, you will be recorded too. If you don't want to be recorded, that's an option, but you should tell us and then um, Susan will turn off the recording device. Okay, so David, this is your first question. Would you like to be recorded? It's okay, provided you don't say my last name. Okay, yes. <laughs> don't put the camera on him either. Everyone will recognize him. All right, so David, yes, please. Uh, so, what, what I think the readers of the New York Times need, and that includes especially journalists. Uh, is a, a, a sense of, of numbers. Uh, what I find when I read uh, newspaper articles is that uh, numbers are mentioned out of context. Mm -hmm. There are many, many, many uh, typos. I would say one in every hundred times the word million or billion is mentioned. It's mixed up with the other one. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's <laughs> by a factor of a thousand that nobody can see. Mm -hmm. because they have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> well, the yes, can everyone hear this, by the way? Should I be repeating? You're okay. Go, yes, please keep. The main, the main way, the main mistake that they make, I think, is not including a denominator. They'll tell us that a certain town, uh, you know, has just spent $2 million on something. Mm -hmm. And with no context, it's a meaningless statement. It could be 20 million yen. And it, <laughs> you would have no idea whether it was the same discussion or something else. Uh -huh. So they, this, I think the conversation has gotten, uh, and, and, and this has become very important with all of our you know, budget, uh, all this stuff. Is sure, especially now that we're talking about trillion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> was a magazine article which had a quadrillion. Yes, in. yes. I think it was a typo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so if I can summarize the comment, um, then the suggestion is, and it's interesting what you are, are doing there, because a lot of people have sort of directed their attention not just to the readers of the Times, but the writers of the Times. That is, a lot, as you say, a lot of journalists get their numbers muddled, and, and it can be a source of disinformation that's very serious. So, so you would suggest writing for 
the journalists, it sounds like, in addition to the readers. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and mm -hmm. calling them to task. Calling them to task, yes. After their nice invitation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, Tanya. And you're willing to be recorded. I guess anyone who speaks up is willing to be recorded. Yes. Uh, All right. I, I'm wondering if you can write a piece, every piece for different target audience. Oh, that's a nice idea. The suggestion being maybe um, in a difficult question like this, you know, about education or communication, don't choose one audience. Try lots of different audiences and maybe you'll be on resonance with somebody at different times. I mean, like Feynman said something about that with regard to education, that should I teach history when I teach physics or talk about the applications or the great derivations of the formulas? I should do everything because I don't know what to do and it'll appeal to different people at different times. Um, yes, that would be, uh, that's another nice suggestion. In any case, the decision I made was simply I'm, I'm going to write for a friend of mine who, I, that is, I visualized a real person who um, I first met at MIT, Alan Alda, the actor that was in MASH. Um, he, it happens, really loves science. And uh, he did a show you may have seen on, on PBS that was called Scientific American Frontiers, where he was the host and he goes around interviewing scientists. And, and he, at that time, when he contacted me here at MIT in the early 90s, he was not doing that show. It hadn't started. I mean, Woody Flowers was the host, I think, at that point. But, um, but Alan just was a religious reader of Scientific American every month. And so he had read an article I had written there and asked me to ask if he could come talk, came to MIT, whatever. So we talked and we became friends. And, and through the course of getting to know him, it became clear he really knew no math. For as much science as he knew, and he really does know a lot, he, he feels at sea when it comes to math. So he's who I have in mind in the opening paragraph of the first article. Let me see if you can read that. So uh, that is, I'm thinking of writing for Alan. That's how I tried to make it concrete in my own mind. It says, I, I guess you can read it, but I'm going to just read it to you. The first sentence already contains an error. I have a friend who gets a tremendous kick out of science, even though he's an artist. Do you, do you see what's a little infelicitous about that? I mean, why even though? <laughs> that is, I don't mean no artist is going to like science. I, it came out wrong. What I mean is he's, a, he's an artistic person and he loves science. So I, maybe I should have said, I have an artist friend who gets a tremendous kick out of science. That's more what I meant. But I, when you have a deadline, <laughs> uh, which this had a deadline every week, I, sometimes it didn't come out right and sometimes the editor didn't catch it. So I do regret that first sentence in the first article. <laughs> But anyway, so I have a friend who gets a tremendous kick out of science even though he's an artist. Whenever we get together, all he wants to do is chat about the latest thing in evolution or quantum mechanics. But when it comes to math, he feels at sea and it saddens him. The strange symbols keep him out. He says he doesn't even know how to pronounce them. It's true, he would say that to me. You know, I see the squiggly long S thing. How do you say that? You know, he doesn't know to say the integral of or... so. This is a big turnoff to people who are trying hard to follow our subject. In fact, his alienation runs a lot deeper. He's not sure what mathematicians do all day or what they mean when they say a proof is elegant. He was always asking me about that. What does elegant really mean? Why does Brian Greene say the elegant universe? What is, I know what an elegant ballerina is. What is an elegant proof? Sometimes we joke I should just sit him down and teach him everything, starting with 1 plus 1 equals 2 and going as far as we can. Crazy as it sounds, over the next several weeks, I'm going to try to do something close to that. I'll be writing about the elements of mathematics from preschool to grad school. For anyone out there who'd like to have a second chance at the subject, but this time from an adult perspective, it's not intended to be remedial. The goal is to give you a better feeling for what math is all about and why it's so enthralling to those who get it. So right away, it's up front clear. I'm not going to teach you how to do the math you didn't learn the first time. That would be a different kind of, that might be valuable, I didn't choose to do that. It's about emotional, it's about getting a person to, even if they don't love math, to see why we love math. And maybe they might fall a little bit in love too. Um, so, you know, and then it begins, so let's begin with preschool. Now, let me show you this example in case you hadn't seen these columns. I, maybe just to calibrate the audience, it could be helpful. Um, 
you don't have to feel embarrassed or my feelings won't be hurt if you never read these. Can you put up your hand if you never read any of these pieces? Okay, look at that, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so for those of you who missed out, here, here was the kind of, <laughs> maybe you should have cut that out of the, uh, <laughs> what did you say, David? I said, who did you say the audience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yes, the, this audience doesn't need to read these columns. But, I mean, it's possible since some of you will be confronted with communicating either by giving public lectures or talking to your relatives, um, you know, the, oh, maybe we can share tips about things we do. Anyway, so beginning with preschool, I, um, I thought, you know, people want to start with numbers. If you ask a person what is the beginning of math, they think counting and numbers. Now, it happens that I have two kids who are now eight and ten, but they, at the time, when they were little, we used to watch this excellent video made by Sesame Street called One, Two, Three, Count With Me. And I thought this is the best explanation I've ever heard of why numbers are important and um, also sort of why they're philosophically deep. So let me show you uh, this clip from, now, oh, so by the way, this did not appear in print. I, I wasn't offered space on the print op-ed page. This is online in uh, something called Opinionator, the opinion section online of NewYorkTimes.com. And at first I felt like this is second-rate real estate and, you know, it's not that, it's nice, but it's not so nice. It's actually very nice because you can do things like show videos or link to other articles. And so the editor said, please use the multimedia aspect of online as much as possible, wherever it makes sense. Though ultimately the writing is what will really matter. Okay, so here I took advantage and the people that make Sesame Street are right there in New York City. We asked, could we have this clip? And here it is, explaining. Here's Ernie in the middle. He's working at a hotel, the Hotel Furry Arms, with these two knuckleheads. Um, this is Humphrey and Ingrid, and they are about to take an order from a room full of hungry penguins. <laughs> And I hope the sound will come up. There it comes. It's amusing, but let's think about a few of the points raised by it. I, I mean, well, I could ask you, what do you get from that? I mean, what, what lesson do you think the, the reader is supposed to get? They, they tell you what lesson you're supposed to get, but you might have missed one or two of them, believe it or not. 
For, I mean, one of the characters says, this saves a lot of time. Right, that's the first thing. Numbers are efficient. Six, the concept of six is more efficient than having to say fish, 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 fish. And also harder to misunderstand. She misunderstands, right? She says she counts five instead of six. So yes, numbers are a time saver, but then there's this beautiful thing about uh, numbers being related to equivalence classes. Right? He, he, they say, does it work for spark plugs? <laughs> does it work for cinnamon rolls? And that's the thing, that numbers transcend reality. Numbers have to do with what six spark plugs have to do, they're what they have in common with six cinnamon rolls. Um, six is more abstract than six cinnamon rolls, and so that led in the rest of the article to a question of the, the power of abstraction. I mean, that numbers are fundamentally in a, a realm like where truth and justice are. They're in a realm of abstract thought. They're not in the realm of six cinnamon rolls, it's the earthly world. So um, yet, they're of course extremely valuable and, and practical. So it led into a little philosophical riff about Wigner's um, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics essay. You know, how can something abstract be so powerful and so on. Anyway, so the, the um, I don't know if readers like that or not, but for me, it was a way to talk about the most elementary thing there was and connect it to a pretty deep philosophical question about the relation of applied math to pure math and to reality. Um, anyway, so then this article appeared, and uh, what would the reaction be? Naturally, it was fun to wait for it to come out. It came out. They have a few features on, online that you don't have in the print medium, such as readers can make comments. And you can find the comments. We could even go down here and look at them, I suppose. Uh, I, let's see. What, hmm. <laughs> um, I, I added notes at the end. You know, you can find the Sesame Street video. I talk about here's If you want to click on Eugene Vigner's article, there it is. But comments. OK, 544 readers' comments. If you read the paper, you know that's a lot of comments. And, and this got to be one of the most emailed articles of the day. I think it was number one or two on the list. So there, it turned out there was a tremendous hunger for this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, a math column is a great idea. <laughs> then this person points out math is about patterns and space more than numbers and symbols. Okay, all right, we're getting there. <laughs> great concept. This person wants puzzlers. No, go read Martin Gardner. No puzzles. Because why not? Here's my psychology. If I start doing puzzles, it's a signal. This is for Martin Gardner's readers. And, and Alan Alda doesn't want to read that because it reminds him he can't solve the puzzle. <laughs> and right, that's the wrong message. I don't want that reader. That reader's already happy with Martin Gardner. So there's, there's a huge question here of tone. That's, I guess, my next area to talk about. When uh, trying to communicate with the public, or anybody, you have to think, what voice do you want? Now, if you think about the people who write about math for the public, they all have a voice. Do you ever read books by a guy named John Allen Paulos? He wrote a book called Enumeracy. So uh, anyone want to characterize his voice, who knows him, his, his stuff? What? It's a diatribe. Diatribe. He's angry. <laughs> Patronizing. Sarcastic. Sarcastic. What does he think of his readers? that they need to eat their vegetables, that they need to be scolded for how enumerate they are, is what it comes across. Now, he may not really think that. He may think, I'm trying to help you, you moron. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I get when I read him. But, but if, I'm, if I'm thinking I'm writing for Alan Alda, he's my friend. I want to help him. I really, truly want to help him. I don't want to insult him. And um, so I tried to use what was the friendliest voice I could, not insulting. But I mean, it's interesting about voice. There's another guy, Paul Lockhart, who wrote a really, I like this book very much recently, uh, came out just a year or two ago, called A Mathematician's Lament, in which he complains, and I quote him in the first, or write about him in the first article, he's complaining that the reason people hate math as we teach it is that we're not actually teaching math. We're teaching all this horrible, you know, how to add and subtract numbers and carrying and borrowing. Why don't we teach little kids about the patterns, the things that we love about math? you know, give them little proofs. They can do it even in first and second grade, he thinks. And I tried to do some of that in the second column. I mean, here's an example of, you think that's crazy. Here, uh, I, it's not really crazy, it's an interesting idea. I, I tried to do it in this second piece. Um, this one was called Rock Groups. 
And it's about Paul Lockhart's idea that you should think about, and not his idea, of course, it's an ancient idea, that you should think of numbers as collections of objects, like rocks. I mean, numbers are tell you how many rocks there are in that group. But then he says you can play with these like as if they were little animals and had lives of their own. For instance, you can notice that when you make square patterns of rocks, I, literally, my wife didn't know that a square number refers to how many rocks there are in a square pattern. That was an insight for her. She was she said, that's illuminating. No one told me that three squared is really because of a square with three, by three. So you'd be shocked what people don't know, or, or this, that you know, if you, to a lot of people, even number just means divisible by two, but they don't get the idea that you can make a pattern of rocks that has two rows with the same number in each row, or that if you make an odd number of rocks, there's an odd rock sticking out. So, um, and then you can even see the proof that odd plus odd equals even. Because, you know, this guy's protuberance matches that one's protuberance. And now they're paired up and it's even. So, okay, that's nothing for us, but a certain audience finds this a big aha moment. Um, so, anyway, this is the kind of thing that Paul Lockhart recommends. That, that the way to teach elementary math is to help them see the real beauty of, of the arguments. Um, except that if you read his book, he spends a lot of time complaining about the lousy teachers and the lousy curriculum. So, so his book is, is partly a diatribe too, and I didn't want that voice, but I did want the upbeat part of, of Paul Lockhart. Uh, the people that I took as role models were people like Leonard Bernstein, you know, who uh, were, most of us in the audience may be too young to remember what, and I think I didn't even watch many of these, but didn't, maybe Diana, do you know, didn't he used to, have a TV show where he would introduce people to classical music. I what, tell us about the show a little bit. Oh, it's, it's highly excellent. They're on YouTube. Now. They're on YouTube. Leonard Bernstein. What was it called? I don't remember. Young People's, Young People's Concerts. 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 And wasn't it sort of like, here is this glorious thing I'm going to share with you, and you're now so lucky that you can. Yeah, and he had, he had all these examples he wanted to show people, but he could actually have them perform because he was a, you know, he was a Yes. So that's the thing. I mean, we're trying to share something wonderful with people. Why not make it feel like that? Or that was the voice I want. Also, I think of Lewis Thomas's essays about biology. That when I read Lewis Thomas in The Lives of a Cell, he's completely optimistic and happy, even though the world of biology has nasty and ugly things in it, it along with certain happy things. But Lewis Thomas is always sunny. So, all right. So that. Excuse me? Anyone from Cornell come to mind? Does anyone from Cornell to come to mind? You mean like Carl Sagan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't really think about him, but do you think he's a, a role model for this? He's, he's big into the sense of wonder, but I also think of his face being in the picture a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't write about myself at all. I pictured Carl with his turtleneck and his hair, and he's in the screen. Like I, for me, I would prefer Jacob Bernowski with his shiny reflective glasses and his unattractive face. And, you know, even though he was always in the screen too, in The Ascent of Man, it was always about something other than him. And a little, uh, anyway, um, these are just questions of taste. But, okay, now, uh, another question would be emphasis. What to emphasize? So here are some choices, um, and you could weigh in. You could emphasize just the ideas of math. You know, this is about concepts. Some people would say maybe that doesn't have enough blood. Math is done by people. It should be stories of actual human beings struggling to understand something and discover something and tell stories about people. Um, history of math. Um, it could be about puzzles to get the reader engaged, have them do something. You already know what I think about that. Uh, or it could be the fact that math is full of unsolved problems. Make it a journey to, to the mathematical mountaintops. What, is, what are some of the great unsolved problems, and why are they important? Um, what do you think about some of these? Or maybe you have other thoughts of what could work. Or, or what should the emphasis be? You want to say, Rob, you've thought about writing for all kinds of audiences and done it well. I, I can tell you that the history is what a lot of editors ask for. They do. Uh -huh. History. They think that it keeps people going. Mm -hmm. I think that we don't, as educators, talk in classroom enough about the unsolved problems because we're embarrassed. Why are we embarrassed? That they're unsolved? They're unsolved. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Hmm. 
Any other thoughts here? Yes? Well, I just thought that what you actually did, at least what I saw, yeah. um, show patterns, show, you know, show that the square is a square pattern of rocks, show that the ideas are something that they can understand. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, the, you know, mathematics is patterns and the insight and that you can prove things and you can understand something absolutely. Mm -hmm. That idea, I think, is already, you know, a, as much as you can hope to get. Yes. That was, that was my own feeling, that ideas should be the centerpiece, that this is about the ideas. I, I made a choice to talk very little about history. Um, and to tell very few stories, which was somewhat painful. I like that part of math a lot, and I think it could may, may have been the wrong choice, I don't know. But so I kept it focused on the ideas themselves, not about history, not about puzzles, and um, not even about the quest, you know, the unsolved problems. So I think that would make a wonderful series, but I don't know, it feels a little removed from what the average, I think what's really in the head of most people reading this is, I didn't understand this the first time. And I kind of want to understand it better. So that was what I tried. Now, um, there then comes the question of, do you drag them through old stuff? Like, if they really want that, are you going to go through old material? Or should you show them something new? Um, I'll tell you what I tried to do was, you know, we talk a lot in, in math about um, we need to cover the material. And then I've read somewhere, maybe it's even in Arthur Maddox's book, in the torch or fire hose that he wrote about teaching, that uh, you should try to uncover some of the material. <laughs> and that's true, it is good to uncover it, but I'm thinking of the word cover in a third sense, which is the sense that musicians use when they say, I want to cover this Beatles song. You know, that you're going to play that song your way. It's going to give a fresh interpretation on something old. And so here's an example of that. I mean, in addition to that Sesame Street, here, here's uh, something from a piece about decimals and fractions. Um, let's see. In case you haven't seen these, an easy way to search for them would just be Strogatz and New York Times. Th this will be the first thing that comes up. So they collected all 15 on one page here. And so this fourth column about division, um, which in my experience is where a lot of students hit the wall. That is, they can sort of add and subtract, but once they have to divide, especially decimals, People get very confused. So we talk about that in here. Um, there's a story from My Left Foot. I don't know if you remember this movie with Christy Brown. Uh, let me skip that. Here, here's, the, here's the, I mean, it was, it's interesting, but I don't want to keep you all day. So this, I thought, was very fun. Let's see if I can find it. This discussion. There's a, uh, there was something that made the rounds on YouTube recently. Uh, that in fact rose to the top 50 in the comedy section of YouTube, which had to do with a uh, frustrated customer of Verizon. This, this, you know, so David mentioned about the difference between a billion and a million and how people get confused. Listen to this. This is a, not video. This is a conversation that this poor guy who was so annoyed um, with customer service recorded and posted on YouTube. Uh, just to summarize it, I mean, here's the sentence that summarizes it. Vaccaro, he's unhappy, is he'd been quoted a data usage rate of 0 0.002 cents per kilobyte. But um, his bill showed he'd been charged 0 0.002 dollars per kilobyte. All right, hundredfold higher. And so he's trying to explain to them that he would like the rate he was quoted. All right, so listen to this. Between 
Do you recognize that there's, there's actually... Zero, zero, three, yes, do you recognize there's a difference between those two numbers? <laughs> oh. Okay, is there a difference between two dollars and two cents? Oh, well, yeah, there is. Okay, so is, it, is there a difference between point zero zero two dollars and point zero zero two cents? <laughs> Yes. Is there a difference between... They're, they're, they're both the same if you, if you look at them on paper. Why? No, they're not. Is it $25? same as $0.5? It's $0.5. Is it half a dollar? It's going to be 50 cents. Half a dollar is the same as a half of a cent. No. Right. So, so clearly, two one-thousandths of a dollar which is your rate for airtime, as I now understand it, uh, your rate for, for, per kilobit in, uh, per kilobyte in Canada is, is two one-thousandths of a dollar. But two one-thousandths of a dollar is different than two one-thousandths of a cent. What I was quoted was point zero zero two cents. That's two one-thousandths of a cent per kilobyte. Okay. And, and I specifically asked the rep, I said, are, are you saying it's point zero zero two dollars? All right, so, so I'm going to pause that. If I can find the right place to go, he then gets bumped up to the supervisor. <laughs> All right? So if I, I hope I can find The supervisor is more priceless still. Let's see if I can find her. So her name is Andrea. Let's see when she comes in. Maybe I don't really don't remember when she starts. They're, they're 100 times different. <laughs> so which is the real rate? Okay, it's still that guy. Let me find Andrew. You're going to love her. Just to summarize, I was quoted before I entered Canada. I was quoted 0 0.002 cents per kilobyte. And just so you know, I have no context for how much you guys charge for data because I have unlimited plan on this date. So, so I don't, someone has mentioned to me, I should have known that what it was because of what I pay in the States. But I, I pay, I pay, I get unlimited, unlimited usage in the States. I don't have any knowledge of that. 0 0.002 cents per minute is what's quoted for, was quoted to me. My bill rep reflects 0 0.002 dollars per minute. What do you mean 0 0.002 dollars? <laughs> <laughs> Do you recognize that there's a difference between one dollar and one cent? Check this out. Definitely. Do you recognize that there's a difference between half a dollar and half a cent? Definitely. Then do you therefore recognize that there's a difference between point zero zero two dollars and point zero zero two cents? All right, I, I won't belabor this. I mean, if you want to listen to it, it's fantastic. Goes on for about, <laughs> goes on for close to 45 minutes. But um, so this guy the, was very patient. This this was this guy was pretty patient. It goes. Um, the key moment is when she says there is no such thing as .002 cents. <laughs> that, that's what it boils down to, that when a person sees the decimal point, their brain, you know, something happens. So, um, and you may wonder, did he ever get the rate he wanted? You'll have to look at his web page. It's a complicated story. I think he didn't really get set much satisfaction. Um, other people, of course, were being charged in the same way. So eventually, I don't know what, I, it's not simple. It's not like he got it. I, I think maybe he got it, but they tried to, I don't know. Anyway, you look at his George Vaccaro's webpage. I have the link to it. Okay, so what was the point there? That this is just to show uh, how confusing decimals can be. We don't, it doesn't occur to us, but they really are, and they're important in the, the real world. Um, using humor, obviously. Now, so another question then um, is, is you know, what about equations? I'm, so far I'm just talking about arithmetic. Soon we're into algebra and geometry. Are we going to show equations? Or in the geometric context, what about proofs? Should I shy away from proofs or not? What, what do you think? Or equations, explicit algebra or not? You can see the arguments pro and con. What would you do? Uh, yes, please. I mean, when I took uh, geometry in high school, and I think like, what a lot of students have a problem with is just the uh, you know, laborious, like step by step, and following the guidelines for proofs. Like, can be boring, but proofs might be a good thing if you showed them in like nice, elegant ways. Like, uh huh. 
before. Yes. People like the picture of the squares on the side of the triangle. Over, I, I've actually been, I've been the articles, but uh, uh -huh. yeah, I mean, showing, yeah, showing proofs in the nice book. I think something that people would enjoy. Yes. Okay. Um, any other thought? Yes. I mean, my experience teaching calculus to MIT freshmen is that they don't really know what a proof is when you say the word proof. They don't understand that that means a rigorous explanation that can't be in which you can't find any holes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know what that says about what one should do on the pages of the New York Times, but it's not necessarily clear to me that if you present something and say, I'm going to present a proof, that people will understand what that means, or that if you do present a proof, and at the end say, we just presented a proof, that people will identify with that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Those are interesting questions. What, what do people think about the question of algebra and, and <coughs> equations? Same sorts of issues or different? Uh, yes? I, I think that the, the book that you quoted before, the, the, the guy who, who introduced the rocks. Yeah, so yeah, Lockhart. He has fabulous geometric proofs that uh -huh. even my wife could understand. Yes. Uh, I mean, they're, really, they're really good, and, and they, they communicate real mathematics. Real there, there seems to be a reaction from some quarters here the way you <laughs> spoke about your wife. But I have the same thing in my house. I mean, my wife was a very good barometer for what to show or not show. And it doesn't mean, it's not sexist. I mean, if you were a female mathematician, you'd be checking with your non-mathematical husband. Oh, I, I thought his wife was an artist. I, is, I don't know. <laughs> Mine is. <laughs> All right, so uh, I actually had a very clear choice in my head, which was do show proofs. It's not math without proofs. You've got to show proofs and, and convey why they're so wonderful and not, you know, uh, disgusting, which a lot of students end up feeling that they're laborious, as you said, or painful. The, a good proof is, is, is uh, the high point of math. So I want to show that. I don't want to show a lot of algebra calculations. Um, there are elegant ideas of algebra, but I didn't feel like manipulating a lot of polynomials is going to work. And I may be wrong. There's also the practical matter that the New York Times will typeset it wrong. <laughs> and <laughs> now I got to, um, you know, I could, I could proofread, but still, they had a lot of trouble with equations, not so with proof. So here's an example of an attempt to show a proof, um, which seems seemed to work pretty well. I, uh, in geometry, the Pythagorean theorem is certainly a high point. There are other great theorems, but, but um, this actually, this comment attracted a certain amount of irritation on the part of the readers. I said, I bet I can guess your favorite math subject in high school. It was geometry. A lot of readers said, no, it wasn't. <laughs> and, and I was wrong about that. There, are, there really are different populations. I mean, I've had many people say to me, oh, geometry was the one thing I loved and how logical and, you know, I hated all of math, but I love geometry. I've heard that many times. So I made the false generalization that, that this would be true of many readers, and it's not really. There are some people who absolutely love the, the, the I don't know what you would call it, like the mechanical or the algorithmic aspect of manipulating symbols, and that's how their mind works, and they don't like the pictures. So it really isn't true what I was guessing here. But anyway, you know, I say so many people I met have expressed affection for that subject, arithmetic and algebra, not many takers there. That's wrong. All right, well. But anyway, um, as far as the proof, so with the Pythagorean theorem, I did try to do it all totally pictorially. And this may be one of the oldest proofs known. Um, not really sure if it's the Pythagorean proof. It may be. It's an ancient proof. So. First, reminding people what's a right triangle by thinking of dividing a rectangle. Then, um, all right, there is this algebraic way of saying what the Pythagorean theorem is. And I've always thought the word hypotenuse was complicated. And so I tried to commiserate a little bit with the reader. Like, who really, why is it called the hypotenuse? Maybe if you know Greek roots, you, you know that. I did not really know. Um, hypo below. Uh, tenus? What the heck is that? So, and then, you know, some people say, well, it subtends a right angle, but subtend is practically the same word as hypotenuse. <laughs> so, so what is sub, subtend? And I did learn, uh, partly from the reader's answering and partly, I was playing a little bit of possum there, that apparently it comes from 
the idea that you're, you're thinking about stretching a string across the right angle. And it's, the, the tenus is really about stretching uh, something below the right angle. I don't know. Anyway, not important. But um, again, this is sort of to, per, uh, to activate the minds of people who are literary or humanities, who like thinking about philology and word roots. Maybe I can keep them reading a little longer, especially if they can teach me what hypotenuse means. But so back to the proof. Um, I thought it was significant to use the word on. You know, the old statement was the square on the hypotenuse is the sum of the squares on the other two sides. We don't say that anymore. Now we say of, the sum of the squares. But of is much less geometric than on. So I tried to draw it with the square on the hypotenuse. And it's sitting there, and it looks like it wants to fall off, like it wants to tip over. So um, to make it more secure, <laughs> let's surround it with you know, the same triangle symmetrically all around, encasing it. And then I thought maybe it looks a bit like a puzzle. You know, that it, so I had my artist draw literally a puzzle with little puzzle pieces there. And then it's kind of clear what you want to do. You want to rearrange the puzzle pieces to make the area that's inside the puzzle, this white space, just reconfigure it by moving the puzzle pieces like that. And then you see there's those two empty areas, A squared and B squared. That's the proof. I mean, we don't usually teach it like that, but, and you know, if you're a pedantic, you could worry about, are you sure you're conserving area? Come on. <laughs> that really is the very, very convincing proof. Now, at that point, I thought, let's talk about what elegance means. I said, this proof does far more than convince, it illuminates. This is what makes it elegant. They're trying to explain why now you really believe the Pythagorean theorem from rearranging those shapes. And, and in contrast, I wanted to show this other proof that's very famous uh, that I think is, a, is ugly, though it's an equally famous proof. And it's the proof where you draw this thing, altitude, what is that? And so it's making a right angle to the hypotenuse. So you put in that F, and now you do all kinds of reasoning about similar triangles. OK, so by similar triangles, this formula and this formula hold, and we also know that C is D plus E, right, because C was chopped up into D and E. And now you've got this morass of equations, um, and you've got to manipulate them. I show in the notes what to do. But anyway, from that you get A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So to me, this is a horrible proof, even though it's equally correct, because no insight to me. Now, by the way, lots of readers said, you're an idiot. <laughs> that, that you don't appreciate how much better that proof is because the Pythagorean theorem is really about length, not area. And the beauty of this proof is we're only talking about length. You know, we don't need areas. You are manipulating areas. You're getting all muddled. It's better to do it with just uh, length. Barry Mazur wrote to me and said, not you idiot, but he said, you, you, you don't appreciate how great this other proof is. Okay, that's fine. Let's have a discussion. And, Anyway, so I tried to show what I took to be an elegant and a, a non-elegant proof, saying a serious defect is the proof's murkiness. By the time you're done slogging through it, you might believe the theorem grudgingly, but you still might not see why it's true. And then finally trying to explain why does the Pythagorean theorem matter, you know, because it's about the nature of space and what flat space means and so on. Anyway, so it turns out readers love this kind of stuff. They, people really enjoyed the proof of the Pythagorean theorem. So I, I better conclude here before we get too far in. I mean, it could say more things. But if I had one lesson to offer, um, I did learn, I feel like, one thing. It's a conjecture. I don't claim it's a, I, I really know for a fact that this is a truth about communicating. But I found, from my limited experience, that you could get away with being either abstract or unfamiliar, but not both. So let me run this by you. That is, um, you know, those are two things that are hard for the audience. If you're abstract, like let's say the Pythagorean theorem, that's not about anything concrete in nature. I mean, it is, but it's, to, the, to the reader, it's a, it's a geometric game. And I'm not connecting it to something about the stock market or about fish or anything, quote, real. Right? This is clearly in the realm of pure math. Yet, because it's so familiar, everyone went through the Pythagorean theorem. Even though it's abstract, it's familiar, and they're willing to do it, and they like it. So abstract is OK if it's familiar. On the other hand, um, unfamiliar is OK if it's concrete enough. Like I talked about conditional probability in the context of the O.J. Simpson trial. 
What, what are the odds that he actually murdered his wife, Nicole? That's very familiar, especially to readers of a certain age, um, you know, who lived through OJ's case in 1994. And you can do a very elementary but nice calculation. I'll just tell you, in case you haven't read that, that article, that in 1994, the murder rate for women in general was 1 in 20,000 per year. Okay, random woman out of 20,000, about one would be murdered at random. Now, for battered women, which no, we know Nicole Simpson was, she had proven, to, you know, she had black and blue, nine, she'd called up uh, the police and said, OJ's beating me up and stuff. So there was really no dispute that um, she had been battered, uh, though OJ's defense team successfully kept that out of the case as being immaterial, not relevant because this is a murder trial, we're not talking about battery, and they said it's prejudicial to bring it in, and it's prior bad acts, whatever. So they, they were able to keep it out. But the question is, is that relevant? And the prosecution said, we absolutely know it's relevant, because we know that lots of men that beat their wives, um, you know, or no, they put it the other way, lots of women who have been murdered by their, their husbands were previously beaten by that husband. That's, that's true. A lot of the women who have been murdered by their husband were previously battered. But then uh, Alan Dershowitz for the defense said, yeah, but that's not the right way to look at this. We know that of, of men that beat their wives in a given year, only about 1 in 2,500 will murder them after that. So it's very irrelevant and keep it out. And so both of them were using the wrong conditional probability thinking because the right question is, not either of the conditionals that the, the prosecution or the defense tried to get us to think about, but given that a woman has been battered by her husband and given that she's found murdered by someone, what's the chance it was the husband? That's the correct question because that's the class that Nicole Brown Simpson was in, murdered by someone and battered by her husband. And so back to the calculation, if you look at 20,000 battered women in 1994, um, one of them will be murdered at random, but the murder rate for battered women is about one in 2,000 per year, as Dershowitz himself said. So, so out of those in a sample of 20,000, about 10 will be murdered by their battering husband and only one will be murdered at random. So it's about 10 out of 11 that the battering husband did it, just using arithmetic. And I'm leaving out DNA evidence and footprint evidence. Also, the question of whether OJ was framed. I mean, none of that is in this discussion. This is just the simple... Anyway, so the audience was very interested in this, even though they had not done conditional probability maybe before, but because it was familiar, um, even though, you know, it might be difficult for them. So, so this is... It's, I'm sorry, it was unfamiliar as a math problem, but it was concrete enough as a, um, a question. But, but the one time I tried to do something that was both unfamiliar uh, and abstract, there were a lot of bad feelings about it. It was, I tried to do a problem about showing what geodesics were like on a torus. <laughs> now why would I do such a silly thing? I, I, I had a reason for it, and it was a mistake, but it was, I thought it was reasonable, which was, um, it's in here, think globally, I'm trying to teach a little differential geometry. <laughs> Probably not a good idea, but, but here was why I thought of doing it, because I'm on the web, and all right, this is not so hard. What's the best way to fly from New York to Rome? You know, whatever, so I, that, people know about that, they can understand that. So now, moving off the sphere, Okay, now we're on, talking about different shortest paths between two points and how sometimes this kind of thing is shortest, but if you insist that you're going to go around the back, then that's shortest by thinking about rubber bands. Well, why was I doing all that? Because I had a video I wanted to show. <laughs> I thought that this video was really cool. And I thought, I'm on the web, I'm going to build this column around this video, which is a motorcycle driving on a geodesic highway on a Taurus.
you get the idea. But <laughs> what, what do I like about that? Because I'm trying to define what does it mean to be a straight line? Which is a beautiful question. Everyone knows, they think they know what a straight line is. Yes, in a flat space, but what would a straight line mean on a torus? And so it means that when the motorcycle is driving, you don't need to turn the handlebars. That's all, that's all I wanted to say. That's what it means to be a geodesic. You, could, you see, there's no rider. Look, the handlebars are... <laughs> You see, there's nobody. So one reader wrote a column and said, the series has now jumped the shark. <laughs> and I, now maybe some of you younger people, or not even younger, know the word, or the phrase, jump the shark. I didn't know what that meant. I had to look that up on the web. Uh, anyone want to explain what it means to jump the shark? So I know some of you know. The Fonz, yes, what is, go ahead, you could explain it. Happy Days went sour. Yeah, the TV show Happy Days, which had been pretty successful, at some point, to keep itself fresh, they had a character, Fonzie, they had Fonzie dressed up, you know, he always wore a weather jacket, he was a greaser, and so he's water skiing, and he's going to jump over a shark, and it's just to do something different. And so, to jump the shark means something that was good has now gotten so stale that just to keep itself Interesting, it does something ridiculous. <laughs> and it has now jumped the shark. So the reader said, the series has jumped the shark with this geodesic on the Taurus. And it really wounded me. <laughs> but um, I think that it was right. And after that, I did try to keep it a little simpler. And so, so anyway, the point was that geodesics on a Taurus suffered from being too abstract and too unfamiliar, even though I had this nice concrete video to show it wasn't good enough. All right, maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, we, we've had a lot of discussion, and I don't know if you want to do a little more. What do you think, Michelle? Yeah, a few questions. Okay, maybe we could have a few questions about anything that comes to mind. Yes, please. Can you talk a little bit about radio lab? Um, okay, the, the question is, uh, there's a, a radio show called Radio Lab that I've been interviewed on a few times. And if you don't know it, it's worth finding it on the web. They have podcasts, and you, know, you can listen to their archives. So Radio Lab is an NPR show about science where there are two hosts who um, interview various people about science but also philosophical issues touching on science or just odd stories and uh, occasionally they ask me to talk about things that have some remote connection to math um, might be game like the most recent one I talked a little about game theory and connection with um, prisoner's dilemma and they got somebody to talk about the history of World War I trench warfare between the French and the Germans but but I'm not sure what question you'd like me to you know what is the question Jim oh the questions of tone and style given that it's on the radio I I didn't make I don't make any adjustments for radio lab to me what happens is I, I sit in a, a booth at, in Ithaca at Cornell studio and put on the headphones and then um, I'm listening to the two guys talking to me, and they're very friendly, and it's fun to talk to them. And they just talk for about two hours with me about all kinds of things. And I really enjoy them, and I feel like I'm just having a good time, and it's very conversational like this. And then in the end, they whittle it down to usually a minute or two, and, uh, which is fine. And I completely trust them, so I, I just say whatever outrageous, you know, silly things that come to mind, or hopefully informative occasionally. And I, they always make me sound, I feel like I sound pretty good on Radio Lab. <laughs> so, so I trust them, and it makes, they, they're one of the signatures of the show, is it is very conversational. Um, so I don't really do anything, I, I just trust them. They're, they're like a safety net, and I figure if I'm just myself, it'll turn out okay. Yes. Uh, do you plan to do anything else along the same lines of, you know, sort of explaining the, the elegance of math to Alan Alda? Oh, yes, about the elegance of, yeah, explaining to Alan Alda. So it, it did come up after these uh, 15 columns came out. There were a number of publishers that wanted to have me write a book. So I'm currently trying to write a book based oh, on excellent. them. Yeah, and also um, several new ones to go into the book. 
But, uh, but Alan and the guy who filmed him for Scientific American Frontiers, Graham Chedd, said, let's make a document, let's make a series about math. And it sounded good, except that I'm just not capable of doing two things at once. And I had already signed a contract to write the book. So with a great reluctance, I told them I couldn't do this. Do, but he had the idea, it's, it'll be me and him going to Göttingen and Cambridge and I'll explain something to him and then they'll do computer graphics about math and it might have been much better than the book I'm going to write but <laughs> I, I, I can't, I said no thank you right now, maybe in the future. Yeah. Yes. Uh, going into this project, did you anticipate the strength of the reader response and the effect that that had? Not, I didn't anticipate anything. I just wanted to start writing and see what would happen. I, I didn't expect the positive response that it got. It was almost uniformly positive. There were, if you look at the comments, you'll see that there, there are a lot of readers saying thank you to, to me and thank you to the New York Times for doing this. Uh, there are some readers who are um, amplifiers. That is, there's one character from Brooklyn who wrote every week who said, you know, I agree with what Professor Strogatz said, but and then he starts explaining more. Here's the right way to look at it. So he would always write his long thing. And there are a few others like that. And then there are a few who always say, oh, you missed the point, or you've underplayed this. You know, so there were people correcting me. And, uh, but now, the question is, what use did I make of it? Because it is very interactive. And I could have for, responded to them the next week. Or, uh, and obviously, I did read some, because I told you about the jump the shark. And it did change my direction. But in general, I did not read the comments. I, I let my wife read them and summarize them. <laughs> and, and the reason was just a very pragmatic one, which is knowing myself and my thin skin, as you see with the jump the shark, that um, if I read them, I'm going to feel very defensive and feel the need to respond. And I won't finish the next column in time because it's coming up quickly. So I just, for self-preservation, tried not to read them. And uh, so I still have not read most of them. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Have you given any thought to how you would do, take sort of the same tone, but in a slightly longer format? I mean, for short pieces like this, you can, you, you can demonstrate little, little arguments. <coughs> but if you're trying to, you know, I mean, a, a book that, and a book is a collection of essays is also small in this vein. But if, if you know, you got to teach people <coughs> over a semester, if you had more hours of their time, what would you do? Oh, that's very interesting. I don't know what to say. Because uh, I've been thinking of this as a collection of essays, which I find very manageable. I like this 1,500 word format of get in, get out. And, um, but you're right that uh, a longer piece, a book length discussion would be, be really interesting to think about. I don't know. I, I, it should have a theme that... Um, I mean, one theme that was suggested to me was this question of Eugene Wigner's comment, why does math work? You know, the, Eugene, the unreasonable effectiveness of math is a deep theme, and you could give lots of illustrations of it. That could be one. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, do you have any thought? What would be good? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I found this really helpful. When, you know, most people, you say, I'm a mathematician, they say, oh, God. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> And this column's actually not a, not a bad answer. Well, this is sort of, I mean, this is, this sort is of what, what we do. Like than, yeah. Than what you, than what you think it is. Um, but trying to actually get people to the stage where they feel a little, not, not more understanding, but a little more empowered to do and handle things on their own is something that's not very tricky. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure how to bridge the gap between them nodding to you and going, oh, I, I, that is cool, and then feeling like, yeah, I mean, I guess I sort of felt like I just want to change a few attitudes so that, because there are a lot of nice books, obviously hundreds, that, probably thousands of books, you know, classic ones that we read that, that uh, when I think of a great, I think of the, the series, The World of Mathematics, James Newman's collection of just lots of essays by the great of all time. And, you know, I read though, a lot of those in high school. I'd love it if someone would just pick up that volume and those four volumes and read. But... Um, there are so many things. You could read Geometry and the Imagination. or So a lot, there have been a lot of great books out there. Um, I didn't feel there was as much need to do that, but I, I sure I would like to try that sometime. Um, it is very rewarding to actually write something and people read it. You know, we haven't experienced this, most of us. 
<laughs> that is, it's, you normally you write for about 10 other people. And to have it be several orders of magnitude more than that, and they're responding within a few days, it's an electrifying feeling. <laughs> Excuse me? A billion? <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many orders. I better be careful how many orders of magnitude. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you.